Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the everlasting truth that uh, we have in our hands and that we can read and that we can understand. We pray this morning that as we, we open it together, that you will bless it to us and that you will use it to challenge us, use it to direct our paths and our actions and our behaviour. May your blessing be upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. My theme this morning is grace in a world of accusation or grace in a world of criticism. And uh, Pastor Steve gave me the title and I think I drew the short straw. <laughs> how do you speak to a congregation about criticism? Uh, how, how, how do we talk to each other about this theme? And uh, where do we find the grace to uh, deal with it. My first question is, where does criticism come from? Now, there's a complex answer and there's a simple answer. So let me just give the simple answer. Criticism comes from the simple fact that you and I are different. You're, you're, you're different from me, so therefore I can look at you and say, oh, I don't like that or I don't like that. And why does he do that and why does she do that? And you can look at me and say, oh, what's, what, what's he doing that for? Uh, because I wouldn't do that and I wouldn't uh, speak like that or I wouldn't uh, uh, take that action or make that decision. And straight away, where are we? In a critical mindset. I do it, you do it. I think you do it. I think we all do it. Yes. Criticism in our world is at epidemic proportion. One thing that I love to see is a political debate. I, I, I love to see, a, you know, when it's election time, and there's been elections uh, uh, in different countries, and there is still, um, I, I love to see a political debate. And so I was looking forward to the great debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, did you see it? I turned it on and uh, uh, looked for a little while and I thought, I can't take this any longer. Uh, truly, it was sad. It was, I, I was saddened to see the current president struggle simply because of his age and, and, and the difficulty in, in, in comprehending. I was angry because of... Uh, um, the, the punches that were being thrown and the rocks that were being thrown and I, I really had enough and I turned it off and went outside. I, I was critical, yeah. yeah. And uh, went outside and wandered around the garden. I was greatly encouraged when we, our new Governor General, Samantha Moist, and I think I say it right, did you get the words that she said when she, when she was... Uh, appointed to be our Governor General and she was set aside for that task, she said, I am going to focus on kindness, care and respect. I thought, this is the King's representative in Australia, surely she could be saying, I'm going to stand up for the King, I'm going to um, uh, uh, be there as the Head of State in Australia. Her main statement was, I'm going to focus on kindness, care and respect. Well, our issue today then is how do we uh, um, act, ha how do I uh, look at different people and what they do, um, uh, how do we apply this theme to our church, am I a critic or, or am I going to restrain some of the things that I think or say because I don't really understand everything that you do or you think or what you say, um, are we going to be people who can restrain that people who will know grace so that we can be able to uh, be with one another with kindness, with care, with respect and with understanding. And particularly in the world where, where uh, criticism and accusation is at a peak. We are called to be people who will exercise grace. This morning I want to take three, three things from the Bible that that relate to this particular question. How do I exercise grace in the situations where I find myself? <clears throat> and, and the first one is that we affirm diversity. 
we've got to affirm the fact that we're different, don't we? Affirm diversity. The second thing is that we need to be all things to all men. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. And we need to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Let's take the, the diversity one first. We're all different. How do we affirm diversity? A few weeks ago, Steve uh, uh, talked about David when he was on the run from King Saul and uh, he was living out in the wilderness. In, in uh, 1 Samuel 22 and verses 1 and 2, we read that David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. So here's David in the desert, uh, the cave of Adullam. It may, may not have been just one big cave, but, but a few smaller caves, a, a, a group of caves. And he's in... in uh, uh, on the run from King Saul. Uh, king Saul is uh, accusing him of, of wanting to be king while, while, while Saul is still king and he's out to get David. And so he escapes and uh, finds a place of retreat and people, other people, hear that he's there. The family, they turn up and people that were in distress, in debt and discontented they heard too that David was there and they thought, we've got to get away also to this place of retreat and, and, and find a place of refuge. Now, I don't know if you can imagine what the setting would be like. <clears throat> 400 men, it says. I don't know whether there were women and children who were there also, probably not many, but 400 men, 400 problem men, 400 men with... Uh, big issues in their life. Those who were in distress, um, uh, the, the, in, the in phrase is those who were doing it tough. We hear about that every other day on the, on, on the news. People are doing it tough. Well, there, there were guys that were really doing it tough. And uh, they went down to David. Probably had relationship problems, um, uh, disillusioned with life, not much in their life that was positive. And so those who were in, were in distress had to get away. They, they found David and they went down and joined him. <clears throat> then there, though, there were those who were in debt, uh, people that overspent, didn't manage the credit card, um, uh, borrowed too much um, that they couldn't pay the money back. Whatever they saw in the shop window, they bought and, of course, didn't have enough money to buy it. Those people were in debt and, and the debt collectors were after them and so what did they do? They th say, we've got to get away so we're safe so we won't be caught. So people in debt. And finally, a, a group who were simply called the dis discontented. And the, 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 the root meaning of that word in the Bible is people who were so sad that there, there, there was a sadness of spirit. Some, things that happened in their lives that had embittered them, uh, hurt them. Their souls were scarred and uh, they were wounded in spirit and grief. And they also said, we've got to get away. And they went down and met David there in the desert. 400 men. Now, could you imagine the dynamics between those people, um, those that owed money sitting around the campfire outside the cave at night and uh, um, uh, one says to the other guy who wasn't in debt, uh, have got a few spare shekels? Um, and he says, no, you should have managed your money better. And uh, you know, one gives uh, the lecture to the other and, and there's a critical spirit that is uh, at work. Those that are hurt. Um, you, know, you guys can't understand what I've been through. You don't know the hurt. You don't know the bitterness. You don't know the, 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 what's in my heart and, and the grief that's there. Yeah. Get a life, mate. You know? how, how, do you, how do you respond? How would they be relating to each other? 
some very strong dynamics would be at work as all these people are with King David and uh, he's got to somehow uh, look after them, care for them, bond them together. And the amazing miracle is that the Bible says he did. David, because he was that anointed leader, he was the king who was uh, the future king. He, he carried the anointing of God upon his life. Uh, Samuel, a prophet, had anointed him, even while Saul was king. And the anointing of God was on him to be a king, to be a leader, to have the grace gifts of leadership that would be necessary to take these 400 disparate people and bind them together as one so that they are his people and they became the powerful force for good and the, the nucleus of his army that was going to finally take the nation of Israel and uh, establish David to be king. Now, that's not an exact parallel with church, is it? You can't say that's exactly what church is like, um, but there are some similarities. Uh, that was a place of refuge. And Andrew's already read to us the, 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 the invitation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 when he said, Come to me, what all you uh, well-to-do, well-off, comfortable, no-problem people. Come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me, all you who are burdened. Come to me, all you people that carry Carry stuff in your life and I will give you rest. Church, of course, this is a place of refuge. This is the cave, not 400 of us here, but this is the cave where, where all of us, whatever our situation is, can come and can be together and can operate together. Diversity. And we affirm that, and that helps us to know the grace of God to support one another and not be critics of one another. The second principle I see in the scripture that relates to this theme is, is the challenge to be all things to all men, uh, or to adapt ourselves or modify ourselves, uh, our behaviour, to live with someone else who is different. Uh, all things to all men means people are different and, and there are times when God says, I want you to adapt yourself to that person so that uh, something can happen between you. When I first became a Christian when I was uh, 18, which is a long time ago, uh, there was a family in, in the church who, because I was a new Christian, uh, in a sense took me under their wing and uh, they had a... a uh, a son who was uh, similar in age to me and so they invited me home to their place for, for lunch almost every Sunday for a number of months, Sunday lunch. And I can remember two things about those Sunday lunches. One, they had watercress salad, which I'd never had before and I don't bother to have again. <laughs> watercress salad. The second thing that inevitably, at, at the conversation around the meal table centred on uh, uh, thinking of someone in church, who I didn't necessarily know, thinking of someone in church and saying, they are all things to all men. And they said it in a negative way. Um, and they talked about this person and, you know, the things they didn't quite do right. They're all things to all men. And I thought, gee, that's a big sin. Uh, I didn't know what they really meant by that. That must be a big sin. And then, uh, being a young Christian, I started to read the Bible. And I got up to 1 Corinthians, and uh, reading through 1 Corinthians, and uh, I read this bit about Paul, who uh, said it was a priority of his to be all things to all men. I thought, huh, it's not a sin after all. It's only a sin if you want to be all things to all men and you, and, and, and you sacrifice your integrity and you, and, and you give up things that are important. But here it's a spiritual principle. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23 that Mark just read to us. 
And Paul, Paul talked about this as to how he modifies his behaviour according to the person that he's with. And uh, that's a very important principle in, in, in relationship. Uh, as long as we're not uh, sacrificing our own integrity, our own character, but there are things that are superficial that aren't necessary, that, that we may think are important, but if the other person doesn't think they're as important as we think they are, then we can adapt and we can modify our behaviour. Let's just uh, quickly run through 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19 to 23, where Paul said first, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. Now, Paul was Jewish. He was a, a, a Pharisee by, by upbringing. But he didn't, when he came to Christ, he didn't have to live anymore by the Jewish legal requirements. And so uh, he, he, he lives a free life as a believer in Christ with Jesus as his model and Jesus as his saviour and Lord. But he says, look, if I invited some Jewish people over for Sunday lunch, or maybe Saturday lunch, um, uh, I won't serve them roast pork uh, or prawn salad. Um, if he invited people over who were Jewish for Saturday or Sunday lunch, he, of course, would serve roast lamb. That's a big tick for a Jewish person. Roast lamb. Falafel. Falafel, yeah. And, and, and look, I'll, uh, I'll um, have a salmon sandwich. Um, and, and, and he adapted himself, as he says, to the Jewish people. Um, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. And then in verse 20, he says, to those under the law, I became like one under the law. Now, he'd already come to a point in his life where the Old Testament law to him was irrelevant as a system of law. He didn't have to keep that law anymore. He was in Christ. He said, though I myself self am not uh, under the law, so as to win those who are under the law. So, again, adapting his life to someone else um, so that he can influence and, and uh, he can be with that person. And so he'd uh, go to church sometimes on Saturday and not Sunday. And then in verse 21, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law but under Christ's law. And again, he's making the point that, that when he meets with people who, who all these regulations are still very important and they're not to him, he can still adapt himself. And, and, and he makes the supreme point that the law of Christ is what now governs me and controls me, that, that there are two main principles, to love God and to love your neighbour as yourself. On those two things, he said, hang the whole law and so he could express himself and adapt himself. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. And then he summarises this passage by saying, I've become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. The principle of adaption, of modifying, so that he could minister, so he could reach out to people, so he could come alongside people. And uh, that principle, I think, is a very important one when we live in, in a critical environment that we can be adaptive and um, come alongside someone else for a higher reason and for a higher purpose. Could I ask you a question? Put your thinking caps on. Where would you find in the one room a Tasmanian tiger, uh, a pistol that belonged to Robert O'Hara Burke, the great explorer, and a writing desk that belonged to Charles Dickens, the amazing novelist. Where would you find that in the one room? <laughs> who doesn't know? Before who knows? Okay, where would you find that in the one room? Which museum? 
Which muse yeah, you're right. Museums, half right. Which museum would you find those three things in the one room? The Burke Museum, which is where? Beechworth. <laughs> up the hill, just up there. Now, Steve's taking his mother to Beechworth tomorrow. Maybe, maybe you could take her to the Burke Museum, where in that one country uh, museum, there's a, 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 a stuffed Tasmanian tiger, there's a pistol of Robert O'Hara Burke, and there's a writing desk where Charles uh, Dickens wrote his novels. Now, the amazing thing is those three uh, disparate things all live together in the one room. Uh, the Tasmanian tiger doesn't jump out of the glass case and, and chew um, Dickens' novel. Uh, uh, Dickens doesn't, doesn't uh, castigate uh, Robert O'Hara Burke for that expedition that was a failure and, and, and where he lost his life and the lives of others in the centre of Australia. And, uh, and, and Burke doesn't shoot the Tasmanian tiger. They get on very well. <laughs> and uh, you can go and... Uh, see them in the Burke Museum in Beechworth, of all places. Now, don't ask me how they all got there. There is a story, but the, um, uh, they, they, they're there. And what that shows me is that... Silly story, but... What it shows me is that there is a principle that we are called to keep the unity of the spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 where in a Christian fellowship, it's, a, it's a, a high priority that we keep the unity of the spirit. I urge you, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, to live a life worthy of your calling, the calling you have received. Be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. In other words, do all you can do. Make every effort, pull out every stop. Uh, make it priority one over uh, so many other priorities to keep the unity of the spirit. And in the unity of the spirit, there is going to be peace. That's, that's how you can tell if there's unity of spirit in, in a Christian congregation where there is peace. Keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Make every effort, work at it, and uh, God will give us the grace to do it. Then that scripture follows on after that exhortation, follows on in Ephesians 4 and verses 4 to 6, where if there is unity of spirit, then together we can make the one faith confession. Straight away after that it says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We can make that confession of faith and that, that uh, truth as we seek to keep the unity of the spirit. And then the next statement uh, gives us the rationale or the capacity to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. To every one of us who, who believe and are committed to Christ and are prepared to, to make that confession of faith that, that there is one and to, to keep the unity of the spirit, grace has been given. We are able God has given what's necessary. Grace is released to those who are prepared to make that confession together and make that a criteria whereby we can see there is unity, there is oneness, and in that, in a sense, there's no difference because we are one in Christ. I'd like us to make that confession together. Now, you don't have to do this, but, but uh, we're going to put the words of Ephesians 4 up on the board behind. And it's good for us sometimes to say together what we believe. And if you'd like to stand with me and just read together from, from this... Uh, the 
words of Ephesians 4. Let's read it together. There is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is an over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Thank you. And that special gift, of course, is that word, grace. Grace, grace to live in a world of criticism. There's one little phrase I'd like to finish with that is something that just helps me to, to uh, understand how to apply all that. And that is, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, freedom. In all things, love. We're going to stand together and sing Amazing Grace, that, that song that speaks of uh, the gift of God to us, not just for salvation, but, but the gift to be together, live together and express together what God has for us. <laughs>